Amen. Good evening, church. Good to have all of you with us tonight as we are getting into God's word. We know God is awesome and God is so worthy to be praised. Church, we know that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so tonight, that is our goal to keep going forth in God's word because we know God is ready to reward the righteous. Church, before we get started tonight, we do want to spend some time praying for those on our prayer list. We do want to spend some time praying for our brother Lewis and his family. We know they lost a loved one, his cousin, and we pray uh, for peace. Uh, we pray for protection. Uh, we also pray for guidance in that situation. But we know that they're hurting right now. And so we want to stand in the gap for them and just pray that God might comfort them, be close to them, that God might bring peace to them. We also want to take this time to pray for brother Jay's son, Cedric, my brother. And we want to pray for him that God might heal him and be with him. He had a minor stroke and he has to go uh, th through some further testing. But we pray for healing upon his body. We also pray for God's guidance in his life. We know that God, uh, God is our Heavenly Father. We know God desires for us to live a life of, of peace and a life of joy. And so we pray for his life that God might uh, guide him and be with him and heal him. And again, we pray for Brother Omo's family, Lewis family, that God might heal them as well. Amen. Let's pray tonight. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you so much uh, for your love and your care and your concern about us. We pray for Brother Lewis, Father God, in his loss. We pray for Brother Lewis' family, that God, you just might comfort them right now. Father God, you know the pain that they're dealing with. You know the agony and the stress and at times the anger, Father God, that comes through uh, troubling moments like this, God, but we pray for peace. We pray for a healing in the heart. God, we pray for guidance. We pray for protection. God, we pray, Father God, that you just might comfort them right now, Father God, because your word says you are a God of all comfort. God, be with them that are in the midst of that family, God, who might be hurting, might be asking questions, God, but you know all things, God, and as we're learning tonight, God, that you are a judge who judge all things correctly, Father God, and you are able to bring vindication for the innocent, Father God. And so we pray, God, that you just might strengthen Lewis, strengthen his family during this tough moment, God, but to also know, God, that you bring comfort, God, that you bring peace in the midst of unpleasant situations. Pray for uh, Brother Jay and, and Cedric, Lord God, that you just might heal his body, Lord. You know all things that's happening in his life, Father God, but we know that you work through the power of prayer. So God, we pray that you might bless him with healing, but also with your guidance in his life. God, that where you want him to be, God, he might be. So God, we love you. We thank you. Watch over us and be with us as we get into your word tonight. We pray all this in Christ's mighty name. Amen. Amen. Church, that's our study tonight as we continue in God's word, learning about God's plan for us. You know, this whole study that we've been on was really focused on who God is to us. And Brother Jay's been dealing with God as our Heavenly Father, and we have been dealing with what Jesus has come to do. Yes, he has come to save us from our sins, but the Bible also shows that Jesus came to reveal the Father to us, that Jesus came to make God known. And we read that whole uh, scripture in uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 through 18, and it talks about the deity of Jesus, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible says He, meaning Jesus, was with God in the beginning. He shared timeless existence with God. He was there with God. He Himself is God. We learn from that passage in John 1, 9 through 13, that Jesus is a God that brings salvation, that those who would receive Jesus would then become children of God. We can only come to God through Jesus Christ. That's what he says. I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man can come to the Father unless they come through me. We learn about Jesus' humanity, that the God of all creation was wrapped up in the flesh to dwell amongst us for a primary purpose, to save us from our sins. We read that, that the word became flesh in John 1, 14. But through that, we also saw the superiority of Jesus, that all things is in his hands. That God owns everything. Jesus is in control of all things. And therefore, the God who came from heaven, as we read in John 1.18, has come to make God known. The God man, Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven, has come to make God known. Listen to what John says regarding Jesus. 
John says in John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. You know, we learn from John's gospel that everything Jesus speaks, he speaks what God wanted us to hear. He's speaking only what the father has given him to say. And so we know that when Jesus speaks regarding God, really when Jesus speaks about anything, he is revealing who God is to us and what kind of people you and I are called to be. You know, we learned previously that God wants us to acknowledge him, that God wants us to see him in his full nature. We talked about two uh, pieces of God's nature. We said God is holy and God is righteous. We talked about on Monday night that God is a God of justice. And that's what we're going to finish with tonight. But what we learn is that when God gave these powerful names to his people, God wanted them as well as you and I to know who he is. And let me tell you something, friend. When we're going through this dark world, we got to know who God is. You know, through the names of God, as we're going to go back and kind of review these before we finish this whole sermon series. But the whole point of us getting these scriptures is for us to know who God is. That even though I'm walking through this dark world, I can trust that God, he's Yahweh. That's the name that God gave Moses. What does Yahweh mean? He is the I am. What does that mean? He's a self-existing one, the self-sustaining one, the one who has no beginning, the one who has no end. That's what he told Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you to me. What was God telling him? Tell them Yahweh, the self-existing one, sent you. You know, that's so good because we know that God controls all things. And because God controls all things, all things will give an account to the God who judges justly. That because God is the creator of all mankind, mankind will give God an account for what they have done. That gives me encouragement to know that I'm not existing in this life all by myself. No, I'm trusting in the self-existing one, the self-sustaining one. I can trust in the God who owns everything. You know, God also gave us the name Elohim in Psalms 90 verse 2. We know, uh, we know Elohim to be the strong one, the strong one. Listen to what the psalmist says regarding God. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I know in the English translation, we just see that, 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 that name God. But in the original text, they don't use G-O-D. They use this word, this name of God, Elohim. The strong one. So before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, the psalmist says, God, you alone are the strong one. Jesus holds all things together. I can trust that when I'm weak, God is strong in my life. That sometimes we get weary. Sometimes we get down. Sometimes we get tempted. Sometimes we're just going the wrong way because things happen. Guess what, my friend? We can rely on the strong one. Let me tell you something. If God is able to hold this universe together, surely God is able to hold my life together. God is the strong one. He's the mighty one. He's the one that has no beginning. He's the one that has no end. Let us get encouragement tonight from who God is. Jesus is revealing God to us. We see this Elohim, the strong one being used in Genesis 1 and 1. Again, we read in the English translation, G-O-D, God, but understand in the original text, the name for God here is Elohim. And so in the beginning, the strong one, the strong one, God created the heavens and the earth. I can trust that when I'm weak, when I'm losing my way, when I feel like I'm just losing it, I can trust in the strong one to hold me together. Come on, if God created this world and hold the universe, the stars, the galaxies in place, surely when I feel like my life is falling apart, I can trust in the Elohim, the strong one, the God who created heaven and earth in the beginning. Powerful revelation we get from God's word because God wants us to know who he is. And as we close in our review of who God is, God is our Adonai. What does that mean? He's our Lord and our master. You see, a lot of people know God to be the God that blesses people, but a lot of people don't realize God is also our master. He's the Lord. For God to be God, yes, he is a good God who blesses his people, but God is also a God that needs to be revered. That means to be feared. That means to be respected. That we stand in reverence in awe of God. Only God is awesome because we stand in awe of him. 
And so we read this very powerful verse of scripture. It's found in Psalms 110 of standing in awe of God because he's the Lord and master. The psalmist says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your, for your feet. We know God, the Lord, was telling Jesus, the Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. But what we get encouragement from this verse is, let me tell you something, God will crush our enemies. God will crush our enemies, those who come to harm us, the devil who's trying to destroy us, those demons who try to pop up in our lives and have us go the wrong way. Come on, I can trust that God is my protector and any enemy that's coming against my soul and my family's soul in the church. I know God will stand as my protector because all of Jesus enemies will fall at his feet. And therefore, I am protected. Why? Because I serve a great Lord and master. It shows the power of God. It shows the power of God that God has control over everything. And everything and everyone got to give an account for what they have done in this life, whether it be good or bad, but we got to give an account. But what we know that God is the master, God is the Lord. And in this life, we have an opportunity to, by choice, by free will, serve him as Lord and master. The Bible says that there is going to be a time where God comes back, Jesus comes back, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and every knee shall bow and acknowledgement to who Jesus is. One brother in the Bible college said this, we can choose by, by, by our free will to do that now, to serve God now, to acknowledge him now, or we can be disobedient and refuse to do it now only to be thrown in hell and do it at the end. But at the end of the day, we will all acknowledge who God is. And let me tell you something, friend, God want us to see him as he is now. Because when we see him as he is, we would then become the people he has called us to be. And there is going to be a blessing for those who follow him. And the last name before we get to our final portion tonight, that God is God of justice. And he brings blessings to those who can acknowledge him and be faithfully obedient to his word. The last name we get from Jesus, the, the last name we get from God is through Jesus. And I think it's so fitting. That the name that truly weighs a lot in light of the human heart, Jesus ushered in, right? We get all these names that God is our Elohim, that God is our Yahweh, that God is our Adonai. And that's just a little bit. There's multiple names that God has given his people. But I think it's so interesting that at a specific time in the ministry of Jesus, the name that carries a lot of weight in the human soul was brought forth through the mouth of Jesus. And he calls God our father. Jesus gives us the name of God that we can call the God who is above, the God that has all power, the God that is all in control of all things. We can call that great God through Jesus Christ, our father. Listen to what the Bible says in Luke 11, one through four. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place when he, Finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples how to pray. So Jesus said to them, when you pray, say this, Father, we have to understand the magnitude of what he just did here. He brought the God who is mighty and awesome and holy and righteous. He brought that God who formed the universe. He, he brought that God who formed the angels. He brought that God who is mighty and awesome down low to mankind. And Jesus used a name that all mankind could relate to. He called God father. He's right here next to us. He's concerned about what we go through. He's willing to help us. He's willing to save us. He's our father. Jesus says, hallowed be thy name. And now he gets to the character of God. Thy kingdom come Thy will be done. Give us this. Uh, give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. You know we see this powerful declar uh, this powerful declaration of who God is through the mouth of Jesus that He is our heavenly Father, and Paul confirms this. Paul confirms this because Paul speaks that you and I get to call God father because we share in God's spirit. Romans 8, 15. 
the spirit you received, and we received the Holy Spirit through baptism, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him, who is the him, through the spirit, by him we cry, Abba, Father. Let me tell you something. We have all been blessed. For us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus, we have all been blessed to receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. We can cry out through the Spirit, Abba, Father. And guess what? God responds. God leans in. God watches over the way of the righteous. God is concerned about his children. And that's why this study is so important tonight. Because here's the sad truth. Is that a lot of people speak for God the wrong way. That's where we learned that. A lot of people like to blame God for all the evil that's happening in this earth. And a lot of people don't understand that God cannot do evil. God cannot be tempted to do evil. And God will never tempt man to be evil because God himself is holy. God himself is righteous. No, when evil things happen in this world, it's not God's fault. There's a devil roaming around who's tempting people to do things contrary to God's nature as we have been studying all throughout the month of June and finishing up here in July. No, when bad things happen, the devil has caused that to happen because he put an evil temptation in the heart of man. But guess what? I know that when bad things happen, God is able to vindicate the innocent. God is able to protect the innocent. God is the judge. God is the judge. And that is why the study tonight as we close is so important because we're going to realize tonight that God being the judge doesn't just mean he's going to condemn the wicked, but God being a righteous judge also mean that he is a God that's going to reward the faithful, right? Usually when we think about God's judgment, we only see one side of it, that God is a God of wrath and he's going to pour out his wrath on all the disobedient. Yes, he will. But what about those who striving to live for him? What about those who are striving to be right in the eyes of God? What about those who are dealing with their sin, repenting and striving to live a righteous life? What then will there be for us? As Peter said to Jesus, and let me tell you something. God's, judge, uh, God's judgment is filled with his righteousness. That means he will always do what's right. And he will do right to those who have done wrong. That means he will be a fair God. He will be a fair judge. He will be a God who returns evil for those who have been doing evil to his people. That means God will condemn those who did evil in their lifetime. But guess what? God is also a righteous judge. That means he will always do what is right in regards to his people. He will bring about a reward for those who have been living in a righteous way. Again, we're finishing up our study tonight. The nature of God is that God is righteous and God reveals his righteousness to us. We learned about that. In Romans 1 16, that Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because in the gospel is the power. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew, then for the Gentile. What we get from this verse is, yes, God is a righteous judge. Yes, God will have to punish those who live in a wicked way. But what we get from what Paul is saying is that though God is a righteous judge who will condemn the wicked, God is giving an invitation to every single soul, first to the Jew, then for the Gentile. That covers all humanity. God is giving you and I the opportunity to live different, to do different, to receive the salvation that only comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, this is, this is the righteousness that is revealed. That's where Paul says in that 17 passage, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Guess what, my friend? The very thing a soul needs to stand in front of a righteous God is what? Righteousness. And what Paul is saying that you and I can attain this godly righteousness through this godly gospel found in the word of God is Jesus Christ dying for us and us being baptized, covered in the blood of Jesus, covered in God's righteousness, uh, righteousness and therefore living in it. But what the apostle Paul is saying is, yes, God is a righteous judge who will condemn the wicked. But understand this before there be any condemnation. There's an opportunity to be saved. And so Paul says, for in, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith 
from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That's what he's talking about. That righteousness that has been given to us through the blood of Jesus. And now we have the power to live an obedient life. Guess what? The righteous will live by faith. What is faith? Applying God's word to my life. I believe it. I apply it and I walk in it. That's what it means. The righteous shall live. Living is an action that we go step by step, day by day, living according to God's word. And the Bible says that's where God's righteousness is. It's in the gospel. And it's given to those who receive the word of God and be baptized in Jesus Christ. It's those who receive the good news of God's word that Jesus Christ has come to save. And then we live in it. Then we live in it. Now, here's the thing. Paul speaks about those who reject it. Paul says that in the gospel, a righteousness is revealed to those who want to receive it. But what about those who reject it? Well, Paul says there's also Something else being revealed by God. It's not righteousness. It's God's wrath. You see, God shows us that there's an opportunity for us to be saved. God is revealing for us the exact thing a human soul needs to stand before him. It's his righteousness in our lives. Not our own. It's his. But Paul also says what is being revealed from God is his wrath for those who reject God's invitation to live in his Righteousness. Listen to what Paul says in verse 17, verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against who? Against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people. You see, God knows how people are. God knows the people who receive him. That's where Paul says the blessing is those who live in God's righteousness by faith. We're going to realize at the end that God rewards these type of people who live by faith in the righteousness of God. But Paul then speaks about this, these people who reject righteousness, these people who walk in wickedness, these people who go against the righteous standards of God. Paul says there's something being revealed to these type of people. It's the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth. How? By their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Why? Because God has made it plain to them. You know, we learned in previous studies that God has revealed himself to mankind. God is the God of revelation. He always revealed himself to mankind. One way he does that, if you read that Romans chapter one passage on down, that God made sure that humanity would know him through his creation so that mankind will be without excuse. There's nobody that can go to God on judgment day and say, God, I didn't know you were there. God, I didn't know you existed. No, God made sure that his invisible qualities was clearly seen and being fully understood by what he has made. That's what we call general revelation. Everybody know morality, what is right and what is wrong because God put eternity in the heart of man, as the Bible says. Nobody can go to judgment day with an excuse saying, God, I didn't know. But guess what? Paul here revealed to us that there's special revelation. How can I live in a righteous way? We got to get into God's word and it comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's the sad truth. Those who know that God exists oftentimes reject the nature of God in their life. And that's where Paul says that God made it plain to them. God made it plain to them that they might fully know and be aware of who he is. Now we know tonight that God's righteousness means that he is going to be a God of justice. That God will be a God who judge. Now, on Monday night, we learned about how God will judge the wicked. But tonight, we're going to learn about how God is able to reward the righteous. Those who receive the gospel. Those who say yes to following Jesus Christ. Those who strive to live a blameless life. There is a blessing. There is a reward for those who who have been faithful to God. Why? Because the nature of God is that our God is righteous and God's righteousness is seen in both his judgment of condemning the wicked, but also his judgment of rewarding the righteous. Listen to what Romans two verse seven says to those who by persistence in doing good, seek glory, seek honor and immortality. 
he, God, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. You see what the Bible is saying here regarding God? That God is able to reward the righteous. God is able to reward those who seek him as we learn in previous verses. And see, God's word also says that for those who are self-seeking, who reject God's truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. You see, God's judgment is just not to condemn the wicked, but God's judgment is also to reward the righteous. That God knows what you will not have been doing. God knows our struggle and our battle. God knows when we have been tempted and we fell short, but today we said not again and we strive to make moves towards living for God's righteousness. It's called repentance. God knows. That's what persistence means. That means we're not giving up. Though we fall and we stumble, we get up, we move forward. We dust ourselves off. Why? Because we're seeking glory. That's what the Bible says, persistence. That means that we are continuing living for the Lord. And there's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days. There's going to be days where we fall short, days that we, we repent, days that we get it right. But guess what? It's persistence. And the Bible says to those who have, to, to those who by persistence in doing good, that means we continue to do God's will in our lives. We don't give up. We do this daily. And we're seeking God's glory, honor. We're seeking eternal life through what Jesus promised. The Bible says God will give us the reward of eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, and that's something we got to be careful. We're not. That we have to be those who seek God, not those who are seeking to please ourselves. We got to be those who receive God's truth, not those who reject God's truth. We got to be those who follow Jesus and not those who follow evil. I mean, Paul is listing for us the mindset of those who will be condemned. It's those who got self all in their mind. It's those who are rejecting the word of God. It's those who are following their evil desires and not living for the Lord. And the Bible says for those people, it is reserved wrath and anger. Wrath and anger from whom? Wrath and anger from God. The Bible says in verse nine, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. That might sound familiar for the Jew first, then for the Gentile. God has an order of things. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. You see what God is saying that he's able to identify who's living right and who's living wrong. He's able to identify those who are striving and striving to be persistent and those who are just following evil desires and rejecting God's truth. See, God's judgment will condemn those who rejected him, but God's judgment will also reward those who have received his word. And through persistence, that means an ongoing process of striving to live for the Lord. The Bible says there will be a reward, honor and glory and peace for all those who have been doing good living for God. That's what it means. Being obedient to God's word. You see, that gives me encouragement to know that when bad people do bad things, I don't got to get out of my Christian character. No, that gives me encouragement to know that I don't got to handle this situation on my own. This gives me encouragement not to allow that anger to get up in me and have me to do some evil things because the Bible says man's anger will never produce the righteous life that God desires. That gives me encouragement to live like Jesus. In what way? That as Jesus went to the cross, he did not utter a word. He didn't get into no argument with somebody. But the Bible says he entrusted all things to the God who judged justly. That means that when I go through things, when you go through things, that's just not right. That people have done things that's just not right. And it hurts us. It hurts our family. It causes us pain. It causes us grief. Let me tell you something, friend. We can trust that God sees what people do. That the Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. That comes from the mouth of God. And we can trust and know that God is the judge who will judge those who have been causing trouble. That God will judge those who have been causing distress amongst his people. Because those who cause trouble, trouble will come to them. Those who cause distress with God's people, distress will come.
for every human being who does evil. I can trust in God's judgment. That God's judgment is just not designed to condemn the wicked, but God's judgment is also designed to reward those who have been consistently, persistently living for the Lord. Though sometimes we have good days and bad days, we dust ourselves off, we ask for forgiveness, we repent, and we continue living and striving to get to glory and living for the Lord. You see, we're talking about God's nature, that God is righteous, and that God will reward the righteous. If there's anything we can take away today, that God will condemn those who have been doing evil and reject his truth. But God will also be a God who rewards those who have been diligently seeking him. That's what we're learning about tonight. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalms chapter 7, verse 9. The psalmist says regarding God, bring an end. Bring to an end the violence of the wicked. And make the righteous secure. You see, God got a problem with those who are violent. God has a problem with those who have been hurting people, murdering people, beating up on people, oppressing people. See, God has an issue with violent people. The Bible says, guess what? Bring an end to that. God, bring an end to the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. You, the righteous God, who probes minds and hearts. God knows what's inside of a man. The psalmist says, my shield, my shield is God most, most high who saves the upright in heart. The psalmist goes on and says, God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. See, the psalmist is saying, God, there's some things happening to righteous people. See, wicked people are causing violence. Wicked people are causing distress. Wicked people are oppressing those who are innocent and those who are righteous. And what the psalmist is saying is that God bring your judgment. God bring an end to the violence. God bring an end to the ways of the wicked. Because here's the sad truth, my friends. Sometimes wicked people think they got away with it. These wicked people who have done wicked things and keep on living and keep on doing evil and keep on causing this uh, distress and keep on causing violence. Wicked people think they got away with it. These are the proud people where the Bible says God is against. But here's the thing we learned from the psalmist. The psalmist had a prayer. The psalmist says, God, bring an end to the wicked. Bring an end to their violence and make the righteous secure. Protect us, Lord. You, the righteous God that probed the minds and the hearts, God knows everything. But here's what I want us to take away from what the psalmist is saying, is that even though wicked men are doing violence, listen to what the psalmist says, that his shield is God most high, who saves the upright in heart. The psalmist is not taking things into his own hands. The psalmist is not repaying evil for evil. No, the psalmist is entrusting every single thing that's being done. He's entrusting it to the God who just justly, but he's also relying on God's protection, isn't he? He says, God is my shield. You know, the violence of the wicked is causing some harm, but I'm going to trust because God is my shield. God is my shield. You know, the violence of the wicked are causing distress amongst the people. But guess what? I want to trust that God is a God that saves those who are upright. What does it mean upright? Those who are striving to live for the Lord. God knows how to protect the righteous. God knows how to preserve those who are living for the Lord. And guess what? Let God be our shield. When the violence of the wicked is running rampant, we can trust that they won't get away with it. That those who are proud and think they did something big and mighty in their evil deed, I can trust that God bring an end to this. God, what they're doing is not right. God, bring an end to it. I can trust in God's power, not my power, not the government's power, not the police power, not the people's power. I trust in God's power that God, you will bring an end to this. God, you will be my shield. God, you will bring about peace in my life. Why? Because God is the God of all creation. 
and every living soul will have to give account to the God who judge justly. We're talking about trusting in God's judgment tonight. You see, Paul also speaks about God's judgment in light of 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. Paul says, for I, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time of my departure is near. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And Paul says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, get what Paul says here, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And Paul says, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You see what Paul's saying here is that he, in verse six, it probably tough for us to see what he's talking about, but he's using an analogy of a sacrificial offering. He himself is not the lamb. Christ is the lamb. But what was often done when they sacrificed the lamb back in the Old Testament is that they would pour out the drink offering next to the lamb. And what Paul is saying is that I'm undergoing the same sufferings as our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying the time of my departure, the time of my life to end is near. That's what he's talking about. But listen to what Paul says in his lifetime. He says, listen to my persistence. He didn't give up. He didn't give in to the violence of the wicked. He didn't give in to the wickedness and the evil schemes of man. No, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. Paul says, no, I have finished the race. Paul says, I have kept the faith. And my encouragement to you is that all of us have a fight that needs to be fought, fighting to live in God's standards, fighting to be righteous, fighting to not be removed from our secure position. We all have a race that needs to be finished striving to live for the Lord until the end of our life. And we all have a faith that needs to be kept, not to give in, not to give out. We all have been called like Paul to be persistent in living for the Lord. But what we get from the apostle Paul is this, is that there is a reward. That's what Paul says in, in that verse eight passage. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. Let me tell you something, friend. A crown of righteousness can only be placed on the heads of those who live in God's righteous way. God will only allow a crown of righteousness to be placed on those who live a righteous life through the power of God's Holy Spirit. According to God's holy word. And what Paul is saying, that he has fought the good fight. He has finished the race. He kept the faith. It wasn't easy. It was difficult. It had challenging times. Paul was persecuted just like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But because Paul was persecuted, doesn't mean he failed to be persistent. He continued on. He strived to live for what is to come. He had heaven on his mind. And what we can gather tonight as we close is this. Just as Paul is longing to see what is stored up for him, the crown of righteousness, you and I can long for what is stored up for us. Because Paul says that this, or this reward given by the righteous judge is not only for Paul, but it says, but also to all who have longed for his appearing do you have heaven on your mind can you acknowledge the nature of god can we walk in god's standards god's righteousness god's word because what we're learning tonight is that god is a righteous judge and god being the righteous judge will judge justly he will condemn the wicked the evil and the violence of man but god will bring about vindication he will bless those who have been righteous as to now come into a secured peace. God will bring about the righteous, a righteous crown upon their head. But for those who have reject God, we know there is condemnation for those who, are, who have been living in a wicked way. What we know, according to God's word, is that God's judgment is just not for the wicked to be condemned, but God's judgment is also for his reward to be upon the righteous. God's judgment is also intended to reveal the righteous 
in the reward that is to come. I want to end here tonight. Hebrews 1.8, very powerful verse that speaks about God's righteousness. And it says that God will rule in righteousness. God, he will rule in righteousness. Hebrews 1.8 but about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Remember, God is a God of justice and he will rule in all righteousness. Listen to what verse nine says regarding Jesus. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions and anointed you with the oil of joy. You know, this shows who Jesus is. The Bible here is showing how God is acknowledging the nature of Jesus. And he says regarding Jesus, your throne, O God. God calls Jesus God. He says your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Let me tell you something. Jesus' throne, his justice, his power, his authority will last forever and ever. Not part time, not some of the time, but all the time. But what God is revealing to us through the Hebrew writer is what kind of ruling does Jesus has? What kind of throne does Jesus has? The Bible says that God has a scepter of justice. That he leads through righteousness. He leads through love. He leads through justice. That is his kingdom. The Bible says Jesus loves righteousness. And Jesus hates wickedness. This is huge for us to understand the heart, the mind, and the will of God. Because Jesus, just like you hurt when wicked things happen, God hurts. Jesus hurts. But what we understand that God, Jesus, will rule in absolute righteousness. He will judge what he sees. He will judge what he hears. Those who have been righteous, those who have loved him, he will bless you and I with the eternal reward. But we know that God hates wickedness. God hates when people do violence. God hates when others cause pain in other people's lives through their own evil deeds. We trust that God's righteousness will endure because God leads with a scepter of righteousness, of justice of love and of truth. I want to end with this very powerful verse in Psalm 89. The psalmist here is reflecting of the righteousness in the justice of God, that God will judge in absolute righteousness. And listen to what the psalmist says in Psalms 89 verse 14 as we close. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. You say, what is Jesus leading with? What is the end of all these things that are happening that the wicked are doing? Guess what? They got to stand before a righteous judge and a righteous throne. That's where the unrighteous cannot stand in the presence of God, nor, the, nor in the assembly of the righteous. There's no place for the wicked to stand amongst God's people. Why? Because the foundation of God's throne is righteousness and justice. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. That's, that's what we've been talking about all throughout the sermon series. Can we walk in God's nature? Can we walk in who God, God is? Can we walk in who God revealed himself to be? If we can, there's a blessing for those who learned who God is and walk in it. Verse 16. They rejoice in your name all day long and they celebrate your righteousness. When the wicked lives and do evil things, guess what? We celebrate that our God is righteous. We trust in God's name. Our peace is found in the name of God. That's why we talked about all the names that God, God has given us to know him by. The greatest one we see is he is our father. But they rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. And here's our final verse that I want us to understand tonight. For you are their glory and their strength. And by your favor, 
you exalt our horn. Victory, salvation, redemption, vindication, eternal life. God exalts us. He gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what we learn in this last verse of scripture, may we take encouragement tonight that God, he is our glory. God, he is our strength. And finally, God will exalt our horn. What does that mean? God will give us the victory. It's almost like in our day where the boxer wins the match and the arm is lifted up that he's the winner. God will exalt our horn. He will exalt our hand. He will let all mankind know this is the victory. These are the people who have won. These are the people who will live forever with him. Praise God. Praise God that through Jesus Christ, we have the victory. We have the victory through God. And what this study has been all about is to acknowledge who God is so that we can be who he has called us to be. Church, may we trust ourselves to the God who judges justly. May we trust ourselves to the righteous judge. May we trust every part of our lives and every situation that happens. May we give it to God and say, God, you alone can judge this. God, you alone are the righteous judge. And may we trust that God's judgment is just not there to condemn the wicked, but God's judgment is also there to reward the righteous, to reward his people. So may we do as Paul did. May we fight our fight. May we finish our race and may we keep the faith that we have received by God so that what Paul longed for, the crown of righteousness, we can also long for that when the righteous judge comes again, we can be in line of those who have lived according to his righteous standard. Church, we love you. We thank God for you. May we, through persistence and longing, live for the Lord, knowing that God has a reward for you and I. Church, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we thank you so much for your word and your truth tonight. God, we pray that as we learn of who you are, learn of your name and how we can celebrate and rejoice in your name, celebrate your righteousness, we pray tonight that we can trust that in every situation, God, there's vindication, there's redemption, there's protection, there's peace, but God, you also preserve the righteous to be fully redeemed on that day of judgment. God, we love you. We thank you. We pray that you watch over us and be with us. We pray that in every situation that we don't, out, we don't act out of our Christian character, but God, we do what Jesus did to entrust all things to the God who judged justly. So we love you. We thank you for your patience, your mercy, and your grace. And thank you for always being a God who gives us a chance to repent and be a part of the righteous. We love you. We thank you. For all this in Christ's mighty name. Amen. Amen. Church, we love you. We thank God for you. We pray for your uh, protection and peace and also to persevere in the Lord. Church, as always, Lord's willing, we will see you on Sunday morning as we gather together to celebrate God's righteousness and honor his son. Church, as always, be blessed.